If one tool can break you down that easily, are you really as confident and put together as you think you are? I'm just, just asking for a friend. Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name is Sam. If you are a returning viewer, thank you for coming back again this week. I appreciate your guys' continued support of the channel. It really means a lot to me and it is the reason for the growth of this channel. So thank you for coming back week after week to spend time with me. If you are new here and this is the first time you are seeing my face, welcome. I make weekly videos dissecting internet nonsense, so if you're into that type of thing or you like today's video, I hope that you'll consider liking and subscribing. It really helps out the channel and it makes sure that you never miss another upload from me. I know it hasn't been that long, but it feels like forever since I have done an in-depth, research-based, hard, deep dive type video. And so today, I hope your little nerd hearts are going to sing the same way mine is, because we are going to do a good old deep dive, finally, into the BMI. For those of you who may not know, um, if you haven't been here since the beginning of my channel or if you've never seen my Fearing the Black Body series, I am a total history nerd. Like, got a four-year degree in it. I love it. So please excuse me if uh, some nerding out happens. I honestly, I cannot help myself. <laughs> and since this topic idea came to me via, you guessed it, fat talk, I have been sitting on this thing because there are just so many clips that I've collected since I started my channel of fat activists talking about the BMI and they have a lot of various different things to say about it. It's not all the same, so I've been saving those for this very video. As I mentioned, I have saved all of those clips which have essentially provided me with my research questions and the questions we are going to focus on today in our discussion. We are going to talk about whether the BMI is actually racist, why the BMI range is changed and made more people fat, and whether that change was funded by diet industry lobbyists or not, and whether or not the BMI should be abolished or replaced, and finally, how the BMI equates to lazy medicine. I hope you guys are as excited as I am. Let's get into it. First, let's take a look at the creation of the BMI, because this seems to be a very hot button issue for fat activists. Let's take a look. Did you know that it was created by someone who specialized in statistics, not health? BMI, aka the body mass index, was created by a physician in the 19th century, and it was created using white men as the prototype for health. Basically stating that white male bodies are the pinnacle of health that all other bodies should be compared to. How is a tool not racist when it was created by a white man? using weights of entirely white men, and the cutoff values for healthy weight, overweight, and obese are arbitrary and not data or science-based. So why do they think that the BMI is racist? Well, after watching all of those clips, it can be boiled down to most simply the fact that this tool was created by a white European man and was used to measure other white European men. And in addition to these TikToks that you've just seen, there is blog post after blog post, all similarly titled like the unusual racist history of the BMI or the unusual history of the BMI. And they all boil down to the same concept that it was created by a white European man. The history of the BMI is long and kind of complex. So I'm gonna break it down here as simply as I can um, trying to sort of summarize the history, but without leaving out important details. So let's get into that. The first inkling we get about something similar to the BMI was created by Adolphe Quillet, a Flemish astronomer and statistician. His life's work included looking for the characteristics of the average man. 
and creating a concept he called social averages. He was among the first to apply mathematics to the human body and noted in 1835 that body mass relationship to height in normal young adults was least affected by height when the ratio was squared rather than raised to the third power. If we skip forward in time, in 1959, a company called the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company published tables of average body weights for heights by gender and age. The data used was based on more than 4 million adults, who were mostly men, insured with 26 different insurance companies throughout the United States. They found that the risk for the development of certain diseases, as well as mortality data, related to weight slash height differences. They gave a broad range, saying that if someone, man or woman, was 20% above or below the mean for their category, they were considered to be overweight or underweight, respectively. They then noted an ideal weight based upon the height-weight ratios that had the lowest mortality rate of their data sets. And while that is gross, insurance companies have been known to do worse. If we jump forward in time just a little bit more, we'll find Ansel Keys, the founder of the Mediterranean diet and the scientist behind the Minnesota starvation experiment, criticizing the MetLife tables for their accuracy. He instead thought a combination of Quillet's index and the MetLife tables was appropriate because if he took body weight in kilograms and divided that by height squared, it reduced the contribution of leg length and normalized the body mass distribution because most of a body's mass tends to exist in the trunk of the body. So overall, through this timeline, we can see that the BMI has actually had several iterations and several updates, which is something that fat activists tend to leave out when they're making their videos, right? They have instead created a revisionist version of history where one singular white man created a table in the 1800s that is still being used today. And that simply isn't the truth. It has been updated and reviewed by scientists and physicians and statisticians, and it's still the best tool. And before I move on to the next research question, I want to pause for just a moment on the fact that they have beef with Quillet, the original man, being a statistician rather than a physician, right? They lean on that heavily. Did you know he wasn't even a healthcare provider? Did you know he wasn't even a doctor? He was a mathematician or a statistician. They will say that over and over and over again. But if you think about it logically, like apply some critical thinking here, it makes sense that physicians at the time would have been putting out massive amounts of data, right? Because it's their job to provide medical treatment, not to necessarily analyze all of the data that they're collecting and putting out in their charts. It makes sense that a statistician, someone who is trained to analyze data, would have come in and, and created something out of the data that they were putting out. Does that make sense? Like, doctors don't have time to do the work of a scientist. <laughs> like, unless they're a scientific physician, which is an actual thing, they're typically not analyzing their own data. Just like anything else, your data is being collected and then sent somewhere else so that it can be studied. It, it makes completely logical sense because statisticians and mathematicians are trained to look for trends and patterns in large data sets. So I, I hope that that makes sense because TikTokers, especially fat activist TikTokers, don't seem to like that. And uh, that doesn't mean that it's false or any less valuable. It means that he was doing his job. The next talking point that I heard from fat activists on TikTok over and over and over again was that in the 90s, the BMI ranges actually shifted as a result of the World Health Organization being lobbied by the diet industry so that more Americans would be now considered obese or fat, and so the diet industry could sell them diet pills. Take a look. 
In the 90s, diet industry lobbyists lobbied the World Health Organization so hard that they lowered what was considered a healthy BMI so more people would be overweight, so more people would go on diets. So overall, the BMI is a capitalist scam. Cutoff values for healthy weight, overweight, and obese are arbitrary and not data or science-based, and they were bumped down in 1998 for no reason other than pushing weight loss drugs. Do you know that in 1998, when pharmaceutical companies in the US were trying to increase their profits on things like weight loss drugs, they actually overnight change the threshold of BMI from I think 27.8 to 25 being overweight therefore legally allowing doctors to prescribe weight loss medication to people who are now overweight at BMI of 25 that yesterday were in the normal category as both a child of the 90s and a person who is always intrigued by conspiracy theories <laughs> I needed to know if this was true did they actually lobby the World Health Organization did diet industries and the pharmaceutical company have something in tandem where they wanted people to be fat so that they could promote more diet pills? I needed to know. Well, a quick Google Scholar search brought me crashing back down to the ground from conspiracy world. <laughs> fat activists are not wrong that in the 90s, the BMI ranges in the United States did shift. In 1998, to be specific. I found research stating that the National Institute of Health in the United States adjusted their BMI categories to match the World Health Organization's BMI standards. Because the World Health Organization had just put together a coalition of experts to study the various BMI ranges and come up with one uniform standard. In searching for information regarding this expert panel that the World Health Organization put together, I found an abstract that I will share with you here. What I found most interesting in this abstract that I found is that the World Health Organization experts were tasked with looking for a portable, universally applicable, inexpensive, and non-invasive technique for assessing the size, proportion, and composition of the human body. They specifically noted that within their study report, they share rules with practitioners on how to implement that tool when working with various people, including pregnant or lactating women, newborns and infants, children, adolescents, overweight, as well as thin adults, and adults who are over the age of 60. So this is not a one-size-fits-all approach, which is how the BMI tends to be talked about, right? It was a tool created by one white guy to measure other white guys, and now they just apply it across everyone without even taking in intersectionality or nuance. Here again, we see that that is absolutely not the truth because these World Health Organization experts took the time to build varying body diversity, different things happening with the body into their standards. So to more specifically answer the question that they typically have on why the ranges changed in the 90s, here's what the National Institute for Health had to say about changing their standards. The NIH changed their standards to match the World Health Organization the NIH is quoted saying, the changes are necessary because of new studies linking extra weight to health problems. Ah, I see. So science was the answer here. There were scientific peer-reviewed studies coming out that matched what the MetLife tables had to say years and years and years ago and that used the same sort of scientific scientific mathematic equation that had been set up by Collet and then adjusted by Ansel Keys, right? It's a marrying of all of these things happening together while also creating a tool that was universally applicable, non-invasive, and inexpensive. The history of the BMI, y'all. Isn't this so intriguing? This really isn't the one size fits all sort of tool that we've always been told that it is. According to one fat activist, 
the BMI should be abolished and not replaced. Anytime I talk about the problems with the BMI, the most common response I always get is, okay, well, what should we use instead? And the answer is nothing. Get rid of it and replace it with nothing. We literally don't need it. If a patient needs to be assessed for an illness, doctors use diagnostic testing to do that. If a patient has an illness, the doctor will treat that illness. If medications need to be dosed based on weight, there are formulas that already exist to calculate those dosages. If a doctor wants to educate a patient about the benefits of health-promoting behaviors, they can and should do that with all their patients. There is no medical scenario where the BMI or any tool like the BMI is the most effective, most specialized tool for the job. None. So we've just seen Hannah saying that there is no situation in which the BMI is appropriate and that it should just be erased and not replaced with anything. Which is interesting because Hannah Talks Bodies is not a physician. She has beef with this tool not being created by a physician but is a-okay with the concept of someone who's not a physician just deciding that this tool isn't worth it? Keep that in the back of your mind. To counter Hannah Talks Bodies, I've actually found a TikToker named Stephanie Lin, and Stephanie Lin is an OBGYN who is also trained in obesity medicine. She's been featured on the channel before, not in a great light. So before I show you her TikTok, I feel like I need to like just talk out her content for a moment with you <laughs> because she shares many of the same sort of fat acceptance talking points about doctors, um, the way that they use lazy medicine, that they'll prescribe weight loss, that they stigmatize their overweight patients. She is a formerly overweight woman who has had weight loss surgery and lost weight. She goes against fat acceptance by sharing extremely logical advice. Um, she does promote uh, weight loss tools where they are appropriate and thinks that it's unfair for doctors to just prescribe weight loss. So I'll give her that. She tends to be positive. But I still have beef with her because she did fear monger doctors a little bit and that is actually um, in my video about fear mongering doctors. So we still have beef, but that doesn't mean that this TikTok specifically isn't important. Take a look. So if you have a disease like obesity, which is a disease of excessive fat mass, why are we not doing more specific screening to evaluate for that? You could just take something as simple as waist circumference it's actually very predictive for risk of metabolic disease. Or I could take waist circumference and neck circumference, age, height, gender, and calculate somebody's body fat percentage that way. The skin fold calipers, remember those? Bioelectrical impedance. A lot of variables here too, including somebody's hydration status. Now we're getting interesting. This is a DEXA scan. This is way more accurate than BMI to calculate somebody's body fat percentage. Downside to this technology is one, cost, and also I have to expose everybody to radiation to obtain this information. Even better, MRI. Look here at how you're able to get information about a person's visceral fat versus android fat. But again, so think back to our BMI test. We know it's not perfect. It doesn't define you. It doesn't provide the whole picture, but it's fast, it's reproducible. And remember what I needed to calculate it? Weight and height, and it's free. Honestly, there's a not a way for me to say this better myself. We already talked about the World Health Organization looking for a tool that was universally applicable, inexpensive, and non-invasive. She literally just said all of those words <laughs> and talked about the reason that these things are expensive or will expose you to unnecessary radiation. Like that's just silly. And, and newsflash, doctors understand that the BMI is not perfect. It's one of many screening tools. <laughs> like I, I think that's the thing for me that just doesn't, makes sense. So you all know I love when we can break things down logically. 
And Stephanie Lynn did that for me. So that's all I have to say about this topic. <laughs> Finally, last but certainly not least, let's talk about fat activists saying that the BMI equates to lazy medicine. And aside from the fact that it is objectively a terrible way to measure someone's health, it also ignores important factors like bone density, muscle mass, and race. And honestly, when being used by doctors, it's just lazy medical advice. Whether or not you do these four health promoting behaviors is gonna be far more indicative of your overall health and risk of death. Fuck the BMI. Okay. So I'm not going to lie to you guys, I picked this clip specifically because she just laid into doctors, right? Ripping them apart, kind of gently, but still ripping them apart, saying that using the BMI is lazy medicine. And then proceeding to provide tips that doctors would provide if your BMI was high. Like, what? <laughs> it, are your tips not lazy? They can't be lazy medicine because you're not a physician, but like, girl, what? I'm, I'm so thrown off because if you're overweight at all, you'll have to raise your hand in the comments. How many times have you had a conversation with your doctor where they tell you to eat more fruits and veggies, to move more, to not smoke and to not drink? W literally every time. Because they can tell some of the things that you're doing based on those questions that they're asking you and their screening tools, right? The BMI is just one screening tool. We've already said that. So I want to say it for those in the back who maybe aren't listening as closely, lean in. They're telling you that because you're failing one of the screening tools, just one. There's a reason they ask you the 6,000 same questions every time you go in. They're screening you so that they know what things they need to talk to you about. If you're overweight, those are their talking points. Congratulations, winner, winner, chicken dinner. You get to talk about fruits and veggies with your doctor. Hey everyone, editing Sam here. Um, I had built in some stories here regarding the talking points that I talked about with my doctor recently versus my family member who went to the exact same doctor. Um, it was very long winded, so I'm going to shorten it here because this video is going to be a feature film if I don't do that. So the basics are that when I visited this doctor, right, they asked me all of the screening questions that they normally would. I don't smoke. I rarely drink. I had to get a heart test. The heart test was good. I had to do blood tests. The blood tests were good. They talked to me about my diet. They knew that I was working out. They knew that I was doing all the things. My blood tests were coming back great. My heart test came back great that they had to do. So they didn't talk to me about those things. My family member who went in, despite having a completely different body type than me, she's tall and thin, they still asked her, all of the same screening questions and instead of talking to her about diet because she is maintaining a leaner physique than i am they still got on her for not physically moving her body because they could tell based on her heart test they got on her case about smoking and the lung damage and how it was affecting her blood tests so based on your screenings that is how they talk to you there's no magic to this, and they're not singling out fat people. Back to the video. Do you see how that works? Like, there is this thing that happens where fat activists are, like, so far into conspiracy land that they think that doctors are targeting them. And they're taking it personally. And... I don't believe at all that doctors hate fat people. Are there shitty doctors? Yes, I have had a few. <laughs> I've talked about them on this channel. They were the worst of the worst. Like, Weight Watchers is a thing that works. Thanks, Dr. Mary. I fucking know that. But those, those doctors do exist. But the truth of the matter is, if you fail a health marker screening tool, they have to talk to you about it. Now, I know this is going to hurt some fat folks' feelings. I do because... Every time we talk about this, they get hurt. 
but every time I left the doctor after they talked to me about my BMI, about needing to lose weight, about if I'm changing my diet, all of those things were in my head. Those doctors never called me fat. I don't even think I ever heard them use the word obesity, but they would ask me questions about my habits, encourage me to move more, and encourage me to eat more fruits and vegetables, more whole grains or more whole foods, things like that, right? It was me who was taking that message and twisting it with my own internal dialogue. And that's the same thing that's happening for these fat activists. I think they just don't realize it, but it's your own anxiety and your own hatred of yourself that will allow you to wallow in self-pity. I did it after almost every single doctor's appointment and I used it as an excuse to continue my self-punishment and to continue spiraling because I didn't know how to cope with my stress. I didn't know how to cope with my anxiety. And when I started going to therapy and working with my professionals and seeing this for what it is, an objective, universally applicable tool that was not costing me a lot of money to run, it became just that. Okay, it's one health marker. It's the one health marker that I still really need to work on because it's the only one that I'm failing. And that allowed me to break my own negative self-talk and to work on those things. The same way I want my family to work on the ones that they're missing, I need to work on the ones that I'm missing, right? So. Once you get out of that, you realize that it's not lazy medicine. It's them using a screening tool the way that they were supposed to use it. There's really no other explanation other than that. It's one tool. If one tool can break you down that easily, are you really as confident and put together as you think you are? I'm just, just asking for a friend. <laughs> So as you can see, the need to be inflammatory on the internet is always going to exist. People will always water down history or worse, spout revisionist history. They will twist things and, and down talk and shame tools that are actually meant to help humanity, right? Because they don't understand them. I think that's human nature. If we don't understand, we vilify. It's only when we put these things into full perspective, the way that I've tried to do today, that we can begin to challenge our understanding of the world as we know it, of various tools, and begin to help ourselves grow, right? It's that accumulation of knowledge. It's always happening. You should always be learning new things and always be willing to open yourself to learning new things. And... I just want to hit home again, like there's not a conspiracy. <laughs> Doctors and scientists are not planning or plotting the downfall or worse, the genocide of fat people, right? Which is what fat activists would like to believe, but like it's not happening. It's not happening. These are people who have taken sworn oaths, who want to see the best in humanity, and I think they're all just trying to do the best they can the same way we all are. <laughs> that is all I have for you guys today. Thank you all so, so much for being here with me. Um, you'll have to let me know, what do you think? Did you know about the history of the BMI? Uh, what was the most interesting thing that you learned today? I would be intrigued to know because there were so many tidbits in here that I was like, oh, that's very interesting. So what did you learn that will stick with you? And um, yeah, I don't think I have any other questions for you. So thank you all so, so much for being here again with me today. I will see you in the next one. Bye.